For those of you that have not met yet, um, my name is Simon Dixon. Today I'd like to speak to you about a partial um, solution and not the complete solution. Um, and I hold a belief, uh, following on from the presentation that Bruce just gave, that if we have lots and lots, because um, I, I recently gave, wrote a book called uh, Banks of the Future, Pr to Protect Your Future Before Governments Go Bust. And um, I was giving several forecasts. One thing that I do believe is that more and more employment contracts are going to be replaced with freelancers, contractors, and entrepreneurs. Um, the employment market is not going to turn around um, due to technological innovation. And I hold a belief that if all of us could just make our little difference in a micro niche that's important to us, where we can all be an expert um, in one particular thing, then the combined effect of all those little businesses um, and can, can make a huge difference. So what I'd like to speak to you today is about how I think business can make a difference. Um, so just in case we haven't actually met, uh, my name is Simon Dixon. Um, my background is originally educated as an economist and um, I went straight into the city as a stockbroker and then worked on the London, well, a trading floor on the London Stock Exchange before becoming an investment banker. So good introduction for a monetary reform <laughs> conference. Um, you'll be happy to know that five years ago I left and became a banking reformer and um, set up a training company for students seeking careers in banking and finance. So have I got any clients in here today? If you'll raise your hand. Okay, a few of you. Um, part of the mission of that business was uh, to meet students and graduates who are going to be potential change makers of the future in the investment banking um, industry and the fund management industry and actually uh, coach them up how to be influencers and to make a difference. And one of the integral part of our modules and course is we teach banking reform and we teach all of the, the monetary reform schools of thoughts and the issues with the financial system. So to date, uh, we put 10,000 people through the program and that's 10,000 future bankers and fund managers that all know that there's a serious issue and we're encouraging them to be more social and change the system from within the system. Um, that's one little contribution that we, we'd like to give. Um, 10,000 people have been through the program, but probably about 100,000 have been benefited from our training, free training as well. So we've spread the word and message about banking reform and monetary reform uh, pretty far. Um, in a few years ago, we got the opportunity to present on a university roadshow where I presented across 200 different universities, uh, financial institutions, on the message for banking reform. And my um, opinion is very much aligned. There is no conspiracy, it is ignorance. Um, it really is ignorance because I have um, spoken to many a banker about banking reform and they're pretty fascinated by the subject because they didn't really know that that's how the system worked and I've got direct experience of that as well. When I was an investment banker my, my job was to do my job. I worked 100 hours a week to be the best investment banker I could possibly be um, and I did not have any clue about the impact of what I was actually doing. I was there to put through deals and I was there to be as good as I could possibly be um, in a way that, that I did that. And that, that took up 100 hours of my week in order to do that. So um, this, this, this notion of an evil banker is a bit of an illusion. Um, however, I know that there is a lot out there and I'd like to, um, I'll share with you some of my thoughts on that. Um, very recently, I released a video on YouTube uh, called The Great Depression of 2013. I hold a belief that this economy is not turning around. Um, I think we're going to get banking reform in the next two years. And I believe that um, having, as an ex-trader, I can't help but look at charts still. I don't speculate anymore. I only invest in the productive economy. Um, but I hold a belief that there's going to be one more little boom, which is going to be uh, about some regulatory change. And then people are going to forget that they can't afford property and credit cards. And then we're going to have the credit card crisis and the property crisis once again. Um, and the path, the economy is not going to turn around. This is our time. Banking reform will happen. It's the only viable solution. And we need to be very, very vocal. And I'm really, really grateful and happy to see so many people in this room um, with a shared vision and great company. Um, however, I hold a personal belief that there should be 10,000 people in this room as well. Yeah. <clears throat> So uh, that's beyond what I wanted to speak about today. What I want to speak about today is uh, how business, uh, part of my book, 
uh, was to study if someone wanted to opt out of the banking system, could they possibly do it? Um, and I spent uh, probably the last five years in research really trying to figure out could someone actually opt out of the banking system? And my conclusion was, yes, there is a technological revolution happening right now where people can do that. If you live in a city like London, pretty much you probably can't, you, you can't opt out of the banking system yet. But I'd like to share with you some of the interesting things that we're seeing and the entrepreneurs are innovating um, to really bypass this banking system. Another thing I'd like to say, uh, this is not the solution, it's not the solution for one reason, because if all money went to this uh, reformed system, we'd have no money because we know that money is created as debt and therefore we do need reform at the top level and it's really, um, while I agree with everyone and I, I, I commend the people outside um, Occupy Wall Street and Occupy the London Stock Exchange right now, the change can only happen at the governmental level uh, because the banks need to be forced to make that change. They need to be forced to do that. Okay, so um, let's, I guess this, this, this whole story all began. Um, I, give a, I gave an, an interesting case study, was looking at the WikiLeaks story. Basically, WikiLeaks was completely boycotted from uh, the banking system. So they were receiving significant contributions and PayPal said, we're no longer accepting payments uh, for anyone that wants to contribute to WikiLeaks. Followed by Visa, followed by MasterCard, followed by Bank of America that went out and said, anyone that contributes, and we find out that contributes to paying to WikiLeaks will not be a part of Bank of America. So we can pretty, say, we can pretty safely say that WikiLeaks was completely boycotted from the banking system altogether, yet, they still get paid, and they're still there. How? That's what I'd like to share with you, some interesting findings that we're seeing at the moment, and also a new venture that I'm starting up, um, which is Bank to the Future, um, which I'm going to be sharing what, what, what the mission and the goal behind that is. Um, so what's interesting is that very recently, a few years ago, in fact, um, the Hong Kong... Um, have, has anyone... Anyone use an Oyster card here today? Anyone use an Oyster card? Okay, so is anyone that doesn't know what an Oyster card is? Um, put your hand up, it's okay, because if you're not from London, you may not know. Well, an Oyster card is a technology that's a card that works off a system called near-field communication, where you tap it um, and it allows you access to our tube station, um, and you credit money onto that card in order to, uh, g well, gain access to travel and transport. Oyster card was innovated off a technology called the Octopus card. And Octopus card was a, a very hugely popular system um, which was created in Hong Kong. Now what Octopus card did is they started to realize that, um, that you, they could allow people to deposit money onto their card or numbers onto their card. Um, and then merchants started actually accepting payments uh, from that card and all around Hong Kong, it started to become a massive, massive phenomenon. Um, and what, what became quite interesting is as they started to accept more and more money onto their octopus card, um, the bankers did not like that at all. And ma many of the banks complained to the Hong Kong Central Bank and said that, you know, look what's happening here. Octopus card is no longer um, facilitating travel. They're actually engaging in deposit taking. And deposit taking is meant to be a regulated banking activity. Um, and they said, I demand that you stop this right now. And the Hong Kong Central Bank responded by saying, hold on, they are engaging in deposit taking. This is banking. Let's give them a banking license. <laughs> And so Octopus Card got a very special banking license, and that banking license works the sustainable way where we actually think that banking might actually work. So this engaged an interesting scenario, which was followed up by a whole load of innovation on prepaid debit cards um, and all sorts of different um, innovations. We've probably all heard the story about Vodafone, who almost accidentally became the biggest bank in Kenya. And Vodafone just started to allow people to um, have, have additional credits or additional uh, money that they could add to their phone bill. And there's an infrastructure built around this uh, company called M-Pisa. Um, and so all of a sudden, we've been seeing these non-banking institutions 
engaging in activities that look very similar to banking, but the interesting thing is they're not involved in all the rubbish stuff, the unsustainable stuff, and the stuff that causes the crisis. Um, so all of a sudden, we're seeing these models evolve for what could be some kind of alternative. However, they all rely on our existing banking system. And where does all the money come from? It comes from money created as credit from a bank by somebody going into debt. So if this model was extremely successful, and you see this migration of money to one of these models, you'd see it will be followed by a depression. So unfortunately, we need the reform at the governmental level for any of these to really, really uh, make some kind of impact. So I then started looking at, well, what about if we just created an alternative currency? And you'll, you may know that Facebook uh, recently launched in, I think it was 2010, uh, Facebook Credits. And it was their own virtual currency. I was in a conference uh, last week where I had the opportunity to pitch um, Bank to the Future to some very influential people in social media. And I got the honor and the opportunity to meet uh, Randy Zuckerberg, who's the sister of Mark Zuckerberg, who's the founder of Facebook and the youngest billionaire in the world. Um, and I got the opportunity to ask them the question about what their plans are with Facebook credits. And their, her response was, uh, yes, we've made the move into financial services and we've created um, the virtual currency, uh, Facebook credits, um, and we think there's a lot more opportunity. And I believe that Facebook is actually, the longer vision is to go into financial services and eventually banking um, peer to peer. And so there's this, but what is Facebook? So I thought, well, is that a viable alternative? Is that something that could really shake up the banking system? Well, if you look behind it, Facebook credits is built on PayPal. PayPal's built on the banking system. So PayPal is simply a front end for the banking system. Um, what it is effectively doing is it's using all the banking infrastructure, um, but they're coming along and putting a new front end on top of that. And so we also looked at what else is there? There's some very, uh, there's other interesting innovations. Some entrepreneurs have created a system through Twitter, um, TwitPay. Um, we then seen uh, innovation from the founder of Twitter as he created a little device that you could plug into your iPhone um, in order to take payments and turn your, uh, your phone into a, um, a virtual payment processing uh, device. And we've also seen uh, massive innovation um, in the near field communication and Google come along and make their first step into financial services. Um, Google is perfectly positioned to move into the banking side now uh, because of the, the data that they hold upon people's uh, well activities and what they actually do. So we're seeing these massive movements into all these, these social businesses, I guess you could say, social networks. Um, internet-based businesses, and they're all moving into the financial services right now. But here's the thing, is not any kind of alternative or viable alternative because Google is a, is a joint venture with Citibank, uh, Facebook and TwitPay are joint ventures with PayPal, PayPal are joint ventures with all the banks, uh, Square is again plugging into the banking system. So what we're seeing is an emergence of people are fed up with the banks. So the banks are kind of moving into the back-end infrastructure and the credit creation. And we're seeing the front-end of all these social networks and Google and various other people, because they're more client-friendly and they're in more favor, taking on the, uh, the, the front-end of the banking system. Now, what this actually does is it really it redistributes the client relationship from the bank uh, because all these companies are going to be taking on the front-end side. However, I am almost certain, in fact, I'm 100% sure that none of these companies have a clue how money is created and the unsustainable nature of the business model that they're about to embark upon. Um, so we looked a little bit further. So we looked at all those. They're not really a viable model. Um, and here's an interesting one. Um, we, I think we began today, Steve uh, talked about uh, Bitcoin. Has anyone seen Bitcoin? Anyone been following the Bitcoin story? So I'm not here to tell you how Bitcoin works. It's very complicated. But Bitcoin is essentially a decentralized alternative currency that's making huge progress. Um, and what they've actually done is they've created 
so this is a completely competing currency. So when Steve was speaking this morning, he was talking about a system where you allow competing currencies to come, to come along and people choose which type of system uh, or how they want to use their money. And what Bitcoin have actually done is they've now innovated further where merchants and shops can actually use that virtual currency um, using your mobile phone and the next version of iPhone and uh, the different uh, the smartphones will have a little um, a, a screen on it which is near field communication where you can tap it, you can spend it and it prints off this little piece of paper with what's called a QR code on it. And when you scan that QR code and you take a little photo of that QR code, um, it, it goes into your account and you can spend it as money. Um, they've also, for those who wanted physical money, uh, they've created coins which you can order and they've put a hologram in the middle of the coin um, so people can go out there and use the hard currency as well for those who are into the hard currency thing. So there's some real interesting, and this is actually uh, one of the only ways of actually opting out of the banking system. Um, that you can do. There's, I'm not here to say whether this is a good thing or a bad thing, and the, you know, there's been some interesting things, but you know, there's, that, that's what we found as pretty much the only way. So what I just wanted to end in, in my last five minutes, was just a little bit of the mission behind what we're actually trying to achieve at banktothefuture.com. So it's five years as a monetary reformer um, and, and further years in banking. Um, we've really been studying uh, what a sustainable banking system would look like. Now, when I heard that Ben Dyson and the Positive Money team went to the Independent Commission of Banking and showed them a model of how to reform banking and move to some kind of sustainability, um, it really triggered off a, a raw nerve that they really just thought this was some kind of value destruction and the objections they actually gave. Um, so our response is I was speaking to uh, my wife about, well, a couple, of, a couple of years ago, we started thinking if we could create an alternative, uh, an actual working model of banking reform, while it will not, um, obviously money needs to be created um, by the banking system until the governmental change. But could we use that in order to really spread the word of banking reform? And it turns out that we actually could. Because we've had meetings with the FSA, we've had meetings with the government, um, we've had meetings, we've attracted a, an amazing team around us to create this, uh, this alternative working model of what a banking reform bank would actually look like. Um, and what that allows us to do is actually describe to the FSA and describe to the government how we would like our system to actually work. And when we describe to them, we follow what um, I believe Ben's probably going to present about later. We follow the three <laughs> principles that positive money outlays. Um, firstly, when you deposit your money with a the bank, they become the legal owner of your money. We said, we don't want to become the legal owner of anyone's money. Um, we just want to keep that completely safe and, they can, and we can charge a fee in order to be a safe storage of money, how most people think um, banking was originally meant to do. Um, then when they become the legal owner of the money, um, the bank actually allocates where that money goes to. Now as we've seen, that more than often goes into the speculative economy and very little goes through to uh, business and the productive economy and it goes through a lot of socially harmful activity. Um, we said we don't want to have any say, we want people to interact in a community um, where they can see everyone and exactly what they're lending to and it's all for the productive economy. <laughs> Um, and the third thing we said is we don't want to create money. And they said, what do you mean? <laughs> we said, we don't want to create money. Now, what was interesting is that then led to a conversation about banking reform. And that really is the main, the, the main mission, the purpose, the goal. That's what really lights us up. Now, because it's a for-profit business, we can also afford a PR budget to go on and eventually, you know, we'd like to go on TV and explain how this is different to all the other businesses. And that allows us to spread the word of banking reform and the three fundamental differences that we'd like to do. And that's a bit of the mission really behind it. We've attracted a really, really great team. We've attracted the finance we need to get moving um, to get this launched. So the first thing we're going to be doing is launching a social network, essentially, um, which incorporates a lot of the innovation that we've seen in the, in, the, in, the fina in the alternative social financial markets over the last eight years or so. Um, the first thing we're going to be doing is we're not going to, um, we're going to be stepping in where uh, people can't get money right now. And if you're someone that wants to create an iPhone app, and I believe that if you're a fresh graduate, you're not going to be able to find a job right now because that's what our banking system does. 
um, then you might want to look at an alternative right now. And we believe we're in the perfect environment with technological innovation for a massive entrepreneur revolution right now. Um, so we're looking at um, how we can get funding to those people that need that amount of money. And we're following what's called a crowdfunding model. Anyone seen crowdfunding? Yeah. Crowdfunding, essentially, let's say you're, um, you want to... You, you want to create a film, you want to create a documentary, and you need £10,000 to get that film moving. Um, you could offer rewards. You could reach out to all your social network and you could say, give me 10, if you could give us £10 for this project, then we'll feature you in the credits of the movie. Or if you give us £100, then we'll, feature, we'll give you a behind the scenes look with the director. So that's the crowdfunding. Mean, you're offering rewards, and I think it's a perfect model for startup because you're not going to be burdened by debt and you're probably not experienced enough to have some kind of business where you could give away equity. Uh, the second that we, model that we want to incorporate is uh, for those who uh, a peer to peer lending model, essentially, um, which is where people, um, as Bruce described earlier, you can. Um, if, you, if you're an investor and you'd like 8 to 10% return on your money, then we can spread that across about 1,000 different uh, people that want to borrow it and um, you know, through and following and using the very same uh, credit rating checks that, that banks might use with a little bit of a twist. We're putting a bit of a social twist into it. Um, so that's the borrowing market. And the third product we're launching is an equity model. So if you're a business and you've got more experience, you've got... Um, and you'd like to give away equity, then you can crowdfund the equity um, across a pool of people that become your shareholders. And you all go into a little group where you can communicate and interact uh, for that. So we're incorporating these three models. Now, the longer vision and what we're, in, we're, we're kicking off the process right now is to actually implement the model of uh, moving towards banking. So we want to apply for a special banking license, similar, fairly similar to what the Octopus um, card achieved. And what we want to do is take current accounts, um, but we don't want to become the legal owners of that money. We want to deposit it with the Bank of England, and we want to charge for that, essentially, um, because we're not going to take any risk with your money. Um, it needs no government guarantee. It needs no bailout. Um, it's, it's safe money, essentially. Um, and we want to, yeah, so we want to offer that alternative. And then what we'd like to do is give the, the opportunity for people to take risk with that money. And that's where we would move them across into an investment account. And the investment account will all be invested um, in the in the peer-to-peer -peer and, and various other uh, products within that. So that's the, that's the model, um, but what I wanted to share with you, what's important, is there's some fundamental principles that I think as banking reformers um, we will, will allow us to put the message out there and um, make some kind of sustainability. The first thing is that the money will be yours. Um, it won't be our money. And we're looking at the legal structures of how to actually do that. Um, the second thing is that um, you will always know what your money is used for because you can either allocate it or if you, go, uh, if you elect to be automatically matched with investments, then you will be entered into a community where you actually interact um, with all the people that you're investing in and you actually get to see that direct. Uh, the third principle is that we will only support production, and this is really important to us, um, we won't give you loans in order to buy shoes um, because we want to only support the productive and we'll be integrating some kind of social um, formula into our credit model as well of who we actually accept. Um, but this is not for, if you want to borrow money in order to go on a holiday, this is not for you. We only want to contribute to something that goes into the productive economy and makes a difference in the world. Um, and the other thing is that we will not use our banking license uh, when we get it. Now, there's a massive challenges ahead in order to get it, um, but I believe that we're, make, we're moving in the right direction. So we do not want to create money. And what we really wanted to achieve with this is the mission of having a working model for how a sustainable bank could actually work, starting with um, what isn't a bank, essentially, in order to, to get to where we want to go and gradually move the, the, the business model in that direction. And um, I'm fortunate enough, well, I'm just, we're, we're looking at also integrating with the alternatives. So what we wanted to do is run two models side by side. One which uses the existing banking system in a sustainable way, However, it can't be fully sustainable because we all know that we're in the credit-created uh, monetary system where banks create money as credit, and that's going to collapse 
Um, so we're going to be collapsing all together if that happens. But we also want to integrate in uh, a model with virtual currencies for those who want to completely opt out of the banking system altogether so that people can gradually make that transition, small step at a time, to understanding what, kind of, uh, what they can do with their money and uh, create a sustainable model. So that's what we're, we're looking to achieve. We're due to launch our first few products in March 2012. Um, and if anyone would like to contact me, then there's all the details. Um, I'm extremely contactable. Uh, you can get me on any of the social networks. You can tweet me.